Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 96. This episode is with my friend JJ Crown, who is one of those people who's kind of lived multiple lives when you think about it, of all the stuff that he's done, and we cover a bunch of it. We talk about being from New York and then moving down to South Florida uh, when he was 15 and the culture shock that that was at the time, uh, just how different things were then, how he had to uh, assimilate pretty much and how music helped him do that. And we talk about how music breaks down barriers really of all sort of cultures. Uh, We talk about going into music and then uh, later on just deciding to, I don't know, become a lawyer because why not? Uh, Such a hard left turn for an artist, but yeah, he uh, practiced law for 30 years which is nuts. He was a trial lawyer, did all kinds of crazy things, and we talk about how his uh, acting and his music influenced how he carried himself in the courtroom, which is kind of really cool when you think about it. And then we talked about how he lived this sort of double life because he was a musician uh, who had his own music out there at the same time that he was a lawyer, but he didn't cross them. So the people that were his lawyer buddies didn't know that he was also a rock star until he got some press, and that cover was blown, but I love it because it's kind of like Duke Silver from Parks and Rec. So cool. JJ's got some great stories. He's a really good dude. I think you're really going to like it. So without further ado, here is The Interesting Podcast, episode number 96 with JJ Crown. Let's do this theme song time. Um, we were very lucky and they, they predicted it right on the nose. And it was like, I, I'm one of those people. I always wait till the very last minute to put the shutters up because I have those bulky kind. And I waited and waited. And then that, uh, that Friday night, they they said, no, no, it's not. It looks like it's big. It looks like it's in your backyard, but we're telling you folks, it's not going to be there. And they were right. Yeah. Everyone's got PTSD from Irma. That's the problem. Yeah, that too, right? Yeah. And Pop- Jacksonville, they're going to get a big hit, I think, today or tomorrow, right? Yeah, it's moving so slow. At least it's a Category 2 now because it right. was like a 5 for a little bit, and that's bad. <laughs> and you can imagine down here, you know, it, it's always that hysteria. Yep. It's – um, and every – and the thing I always I, – it was funny. I was, I was talking to my friends the other day, and I asked them, every time you see on TV down here, you know, everybody's lined up at the Home Depot. Two yep. million people are <laughs> – I always, I don't know if you and I talked about this, I always wondered, you know, what did they do last year? Don't they save, yeah. <laughs> you know, the plywood and the, the, and the batteries that they have? Don't they save that stuff on a shelf in a garage or something? And you see them every year. It's like they never bought hurricane supplies before. Yep. I always get a, yeah, it was it's a true. Joke. It's true. I What's crazy is the people here were like, oh, God. I was like, God, look at the map, guys. We're like, we're not even getting touched. Like, we were out of gas for like three days. Really? People, yeah. People? people are just panicking. Interesting, because the cone, I, I mean, I'm sure you don't remember this, or you made from Nostalgia TV, there was an old show in the 60s called Get Smart, and it was yes. written by uh, right by Mel, Mel Brooks, Amazing. and uh, they used to have what they call the cone of silence, yeah. where, yep. where secret agent, right, would sit with his boss, and this big plexiglass thing would come over their heads, you know, that was like, I always think, we're in the cone of, of you know, of certain, uncertainty. Yeah, exactly, we're in the cone of hysteria, and then yeah, it's always it. the cone of uncertainty, it's like, a hurricane comes, it's like, all of Florida, it's in the cone, yeah. we'll figure right. it out when it gets closer. Right, right. Crazy. And it's, you know, and you know, and I, I think sometimes that the weather people have stock in like Home Depot and yeah. stuff. You know, they, <laughs> yeah. The more riled up they can get you, you know, the more sales and money in their pockets. That's right. It's all about water bottles. <laughs> so we so, didn't know. <laughs> I, no, it's really, it's crazy. I didn't think it was going to be this way, but it has been like this this past week. Yeah, 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 pretty nice. So you're in Miami. So yes. lo- we got lucky because it kept going north. Did very, very Are lucky. you from Miami? No, I'm okay. originally from New Jersey, New York area. Oh, right and on, right on. I came down to Fort Lauderdale when I was about 15 after my dad died. And my mom decided we needed a big change of scenery. So I'd never been to Florida. And she moved uh, me and her, just the two of us, down to Fort Lauderdale. And that was way back in the early 70s. 
And uh, I remember going to my high school and it was just getting integrated for like the first time. Sure. And it was really weird for me growing up, you know, in New York, there were black kids in my class all the time, Puerto Rican kids. China. So it was very weird. And there I was, 1971, 72. And it was like the first year of busing, you know, into my sure. house. They had black kids coming in. And I was all, it was a weird culture shock for me moving down here from there back in those days it was i bet coming from like this is just the normal thing where it's a big deal down here in the south I, yeah it was yeah, very strange i was also you know and it was interesting and i was one of the few uh, ethnic background guys in my high school sure everyone was of you know english irish scottish stock and you know old and everyone was brown and johnson and you know that was all the names like that and, uh, you know, I was different than all those people. I had come, you know, my Italian, I'm half Italian, half Russian heritage, mm -hmm. you know, so it was weird. So uh, definitely a culture shock. But I got into it after a while. Music got me, got me into it in high school because I was a musician always. And I was able to meet guys who also played guitar. And I had gone in New York at the time. You know, we were listening to like early grand funk and the Grateful Dead and, and Led Zepp and all that. And I come down here and it's this Leonard Skinner, Molly <laughs> Hatchet, the Allman Brothers. Sure. And I never heard that stuff. And so for me, it was really cool. So, hey, musically, I can adapt. I can play this stuff. Okay, sure. I got my side here, you know? You found so your that, end. Yeah, man. So that, that got me in. The, the music thing was a big part of my life, still is. But and as far as assimilating to Miami, South Florida culture, music did it for me, really. That makes sense. A lot of people talk about that, that music transcends everything, like language and barriers, whatever. It's like music is something we can all come together with. That's pretty Absolutely. cool. You, you, you're, very, you did it. Yeah, I was very, very lucky. And uh, some of the friends that I met in high school who were musician buddies with mine are still, to this day, musicians. Uh, you know, one or two of them sort of made it big with some big name bands and then kind of went through it all and then went through the money and they're not big anymore sure but uh, the rest of them still play and so we're a bunch of uh, you know 60 year old guys and when we get together you know we're still playing you know communication breakdown yeah and, you know, there you go so it's kind of a cool bonding thing that was always easy for me moving to different places like that sure what did you play Guitar, piano, bass, and I sing. My main back in the, those days, though, with bands, I was mostly a lead guitar player. Cool. I was mostly that kind of thing, and I was like into Jeff Beck and yeah. Eric and and all that kind of style of playing, you know. And of course, now it's all shredding and the whole Eddie Van Halen school yep. of playing. You know, it's different than it was back in those days, but man, yeah, it was a lot of fun and got me. Uh, I met girls. There you, you know, go. You but I always, always have a guitar with you. <laughs> but Brian, I was always good in school. I always did well with that. So for me, I had like a kind of a, it was always like a double life thing. I was like, you know, good in top of my class type thing. And then also rock and roll guy playing in the bands. There you go. Well was rounded. All, <laughs> yeah, it was like, and then acting, same thing. I was doing acting then. Always had to be in the school plays and the musicals and stuff. I remember Oklahoma you know, was one of my first big There you go. <laughs> Judd Fry. So, uh, yeah, there's always, but for me, it was always a great way to meet people. So sure. that's, uh, man, the arts. Definitely universe. helps, especially in those sort of like changes, you know, any sort of arts is expression. So you got to get that stuff out. So that's right. it's good that's to have those right. outlets for sure. And I, I needed it because I was, you know, I lost my dad. I didn't have any other, you know, people around me. So I was a pretty lonely kind of a, not lonely guy. I was like the oddball kind of a guy. You sure, know? sure. But it was good to have music and getting with people. And same thing with theater and acting. Right. Is you, Are your family musicians as well or something you just not picked up on your own? Not a single one. Really? We used to make a joke about that. I think my father played the harmonica back in the 40s oh, when he was cool. a kid. And that's it. We have no musicality in my family at all. Nobody knows where that came from. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's been cool. It's been cool. I've, I've had some, you know, a modicum of success musically. Sure. You know, if, I, if you looked me up on Google, you'll see, you know, I had records. And back in uh, 2013, 14, I was on the country charts. And I did pretty well, you know, for an independent release. And that was cool. But, um doesn't pay much money. I tell you. <laughs> yeah. That's the arts, though, isn't it? <laughs> mm. Yeah. Absolutely. But I find, like, like you and I were talking, the film business, actually, I make a lot more money in the film business than I ever did as a musician. And okay. I get 
I get royalty checks, you know, three dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> three months, but I just can't survive on it. So, but you know, you do these films and things like the way I met you. Yep. And, you know, you get a few hundred bucks for a day and whatnot. That's more than most, and most musicians will tell you that that's more than they make. Yeah. You know, playing in a club for six hours. You split it up between a band, maybe you're making seventy five dollars or something for the whole night's work if you're lucky. So sure. there's way more. There's way more like pick yourself up and set up. Like I feel like there's almost oh. more work as a musician. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> completely, know? and that's exact. I used to hate it. The amplifiers, um, of course, over the years those got smaller. But back in the seventies, if you wanted a big sound, you had these huge Ampeg, Marshall, High Watt, and these amps. The speaker columns themselves were as tall as a person. Yeah, you know, like just half five feet tall. <laughs> And then you had the head, you know. So it was always a big deal with schlepping the equipment. I, I mean, you grow up as a musician with that. And I got to really hate that after a while. I know why bands, you know, have gr- roadies. I would yeah, say yeah. <laughs> roadies to do that. But, yeah, and it, it's a lot more work. And f- figure for film, so you're preparing for some, like, one-day scene or so. Like, you know, you and I were doing something like that. Maybe you spend two, three days of, you know, memorizing, things like that. Yep. And then you're there and you do the work. But, you know, music, that's something, you know, you had to buy guitars and you had to change your strings and you had to rehearse the same, you know, 18 songs, you know, 20 times. And you know, all those hours that go in before the actual gig yeah. you know, is no comparison with music and acting that way. For sure. And a lot of the times you go through all of that and you have a hard time getting a gig because you got to oh, go yeah. out and pitch yourself and book things. Oh. and. It's awful. I have friends, and like I say, I have friends who are in their 60s, and God bless them, and they still do that. And it, it's real tough, and it gets tougher as you get older. Last, The last stuff I used to play was when my last album came out, and it did pretty well, and so I got booked at some of these festivals. And that's cool. And yeah. they treat you a little bit of a star treatment. You go down these nice. things. You're playing for a thousand people or whatnot, and you're part of this whole lineup of new song, up-and-coming songwriters and stuff. So I did a bunch of those for like five years um, in the early 2000s, and that was cool. That was cool. I, I like doing that. It's just me, and, and it's just original music of mine. It's not having to play Sweet Home Alabama. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Free Bird. Just, right. Oh, my God. It's not having it. Uh, yes, that's really true for me. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I mean, but you got to do my own stuff and then push your own CDs and that stuff. So well, that's cool, but I don't play clubs anymore or any of that stuff. Acting is completely taking the forefront, you know, with my use of whatever talents I have. So There you go. So <laughs> with somebody who's been so creative from a young age, what made you want to be a lawyer? Because that seems a hard left turn. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It was. And I'll tell you, I, in college, I was a major in the English, drama, music. You know, those were my major su- su- subjects. And when I got out, I tried to get jobs at advertising agencies, sure. TV stations. I tried and tried. I pounded the pavements in, in Miami, I remember very well, for about a year, year and a half. All I could get was a gig as a night watchman at a sleazy motel in Fort Lauderdale on Federal <laughs> Highway. There you go. The hookers used to come in and rent their rooms. I got a job there, and I could live on the premises if I worked at the night clerk. So I lived in one little room, there you and go. I worked as a night clerk, and I said, wow, you know, I'm out of college, <laughs> you know, money spent, like the Beatles song, and oh my God, what am I going to do? What is this? And I just decided, I said, you know what, I was always good at English and, and, and history and this and that, why don't I take the LSAT and try to be a lawyer? And, uh, you know, it went that way, and when I got really? into school, it was weird, because just random. I just, yeah, uh, everybody there, because, you know, oh, my daddy was a lawyer, my grandma's a lawyer, my right. my governor it's all very nepotistic business man i'd say a good 70 percent of the people in law school are from families of lawyers wow. and i was just this rock and roll guy with long hair <laughs> and i didn't look like any of them and it was weird but then i they found out i had some aptitude for trial work uh, standing on my feet and talking to audiences hey <laughs> hey i see the line here <laughs> yeah so they they said you know you got to be a trial lawyer and that's how I became a criminal defense lawyer. And that's that was how I had no intent. I thought maybe I'd be like a, an entertainment lawyer, you know, sure. represent bands and copyright and stuff. But that's really dry stuff. And so uh, I went the other way. And that's that took me on a detour for about over 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> just a little. You just wanted I, to try it out for a little while. Yeah, a little chunk there. <laughs> 
but it enabled me, you know, to have, it enabled me to buy every guitar I ever wanted to own. There we go. There <laughs> we go. Recording equipment. And I kept in the business. I did voiceover work. I was working for some radio stations here. I would do stuff on weekends. And then I started playing with bands on weekends when I was a lawyer. Sure. But I always kept the two lives separated. I tried never to let the law people know that I was a musician doing this other thing on the side. Sure, sure. So I'd say probably for the first eight or nine years, it worked out okay. Nobody knew except a couple close friends. And then, unfortunately, I got some press, and they put me on the cover of this, one of those, you know, entertainment magazines, and they said the headline was, um, Lawyer by Day, Rocker by Night. <laughs> and that was it. And then it all blew up. And then uh, I remember, and I was just thinking about this yesterday, I was up for some kind of a promotion at the law office. Mm -hmm. And then the boss calls me in. I says, oh, this is great. He's calling me in to give me this new slot as, you know, head of the narcotics trials or something. Yeah. Walk in there, and he's got that stupid paper. <laughs> and he holds it up to me. I never forget this. And he says, so... If you're so busy with this rock and roll, how do you have time to be a lawyer? Huh? And I said, listen, I, you, you love my work. I've been here eight years. I win cases. I do the, you know, oh, I don't know if you have the dedication. It's like, oh, what the hell are you talking? Yeah. And people cop an attitude. And that kind Jeez. of blossom where, you know, some of the people at work had a weird attitude. Oh, he's the rock and roll guy. Is he really a good enough lawyer to be here in this office? Because he plays rock and roll. Wait a second. They were like Jeez. that. Sounds like, like, sounds like a little bit of jealousy, maybe. Just yeah, a tiny a, bit. There was a little bit. Then it all turned another way to my advantage, where all of a sudden, um, for instance, the, the man, I, of course, never mentioned names, but the man who was like uh, one of the big administrative heads of the big law office, mm -hmm. the man who basically gives you your raises, came up to me one day and said, so I've been reading about you. Um, my wife wants to produce a musical. And <laughs> I was wondering if you wouldn't mind writing songs and recording songs in it for my wife. So what am I going to do? And so that's yeah, when it there. complicated. <laughs> All of a sudden, the art and the law started, you know, intersecting in a way I didn't expect. And so then I get involved in these office projects. And then they all... The boss says, oh, you know, if you're so talented, you're going to run the yearly talent show for oh, our course. <laughs> so every year they would make me get a bunch of, you know, amateur, you know, musician wannabes from the office. Yeah. A drummer who hadn't used his kit since his bar mitzvah, you know, yeah. like <laughs> stuff like that. Sure. OK, put these people together there, JJ, and make a band, you know. Sure. And so that became a big deal. I had to do that every year. I had to be in projects that I really, you know, didn't expect to be in. Right. And so the art and the law, you know, kind of collided. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> that's, uh -huh. like, uh, that's like I've been watching uh, Parks and Rec for the first time, uh -huh. and yeah. Ron Swanson is Duke Silver. He's got, like, yeah. a fake name where he plays yeah. saxophone. So yeah. you're, you're a rock star lawyer. That's pretty good, J.J. That And, you know, a lot of parallels there because that's exactly right. People then all of a sudden they found that newspaper article. Then they found me, you know, playing on radio stations. Yeah, yeah. And those are the days, you know, before big Internet use. Sure. So it's very, very interesting. And, the, and then we're talking like 19, you know, 85, 86, that kind of thing. Sure. So, yeah, it was very weird. And then all of a sudden I had to become the rock and roll lawyer guy. And everybody knew about both of my lives. You know. Sure. As long as you didn't start, like, singing your opening statements, I think you're good. Oh, no. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, Brian. I've used, and going to the acting stuff, many of my acting techniques as a trial lawyer. Oh, which I bet. Extremely handy. And people used to ask me, you know, where'd you get that from? It's like, well, you know, I've studied acting. I like to do this. I'm, you know, kind of an artsy guy. And uh, so I'll go outside the box sometimes. Sure. So there, there were instances where that helped. That's yeah, I never thought about that. Because it, it, it can very much be theatrical. You have an audience, you're trying to display a case. Uh, and, yeah. I'll give you an example. For instance, memorization. Yep. I'm really good, and you probably you know memorize lines. I got really good at memorizing. I had lots of tricks for memorizing pages and pages of lines. I started using it in the courtroom. And for instance, if anybody has ever been through the jury selection process, right? Mm -hmm. They bring 40, 50 people into the courtroom, 
And then they take 20, 30 of them, and they put them in the chairs, and the lawyers get to ask them questions, et cetera. And so it always works like, you know, well, the prosecutor gets up there, and they have, you know, a big notebook in front of them, and they're at a podium, and they have a little chart with little squares, and they're, what is it, by sitting their names. And they go, oh, let me see now, Mr. Um, um, uh, Velasquez in our seat number one, uh, do you know what reasonable doubt? And they do this stuff. I would get up there. I would have all 30, 40 names memorized. Wow. I'd not memorized. I'd have all of their bios memorized that they give us beforehand so I knew what their husbands and wives did. So I'd walk up there very dramatically. <laughs> I would push the, 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 the podium aside. There you go. Throw the papers on the floor, get right up to the jury, and just start my memory. It's like, so, Mr. Velasquez, you said the same thing that Mr. Greenberg over there said about reasonable doubt. But Miss Smith was talking about the presumption of innocence. But remember when Mr. Johnson over here did this? And, you know, he's the one who has a brother who's a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> and they're looking at you like, holy crap. Sure. <laughs> it's like Clue. <laughs> it's the show. Where did he come from? Yeah. And I'll tell you what, man, I became really well known in the courthouse for doing that. I was the lawyer, you know, who memorized everything. And then with my closing arguments, I'll just get up there like a big monologue, you know, yeah. and, and with no cue cards, you know, and just do it like that. And people respond to that. You know, I mean, you can say what you want about the criminal justice system, but it's a very human element, you know, with jurors. And people respond to that. And I've, I've had them come up to me and say, you know what? From the minute you got up there, knew like all 50 people's names and that, uh, you sold me, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. That's awesome. So that there was an acting skill, you know, that came in handy in the law. That, I, that, I didn't mind that. You know, sure. those intersecting. <laughs> right. And isn't like boiling it down to the most thing, like a lot of law is memorization as well because you have to know the laws and how it works. And it's like who knows the rules better and then how to argue for your client. That is the classic way, but you understand in today's day, these kids, and I call them kids, they come in with their MacBooks and they have it right in their hand as they're talking to the judge. And you know what, Your Honor, I'm going to cite up, bam, and just, you know, hit the number and a Zion Smith versus State, you know, 17, da, da, da. And that's what they do now. They all have those. So, yes, in the old days, we had to stuff off. That's correct. But these days, I think ever since the early 90s, uh, these lawyers just come in and it's all on hard drive. And it's all in little notebooks and that's how they do. So you don't really have to memorize cases and things anymore. Those days are pretty much gone. It's just there at your fingertips. Sure. You just got to do your research beforehand and have it right, ready so you exactly. can pull of course. it up. Of course. But it's a little different than in my in my day, in the olden days olden days there yeah <laughs> sure sure see i i've been lucky enough not to be on a criminal trial before so oh, uh -huh. you know it's uh it's only legal if you get caught um so right i'm wondering what is the so you said you were a trial lawyer what is yes. a trial lawyer versus other kinds of lawyers right the other kinds of lawyers are the people who do uh, basically the paperwork law. We're talking about property law, people who draw up leases and management agreements, uh, corporate law. You know, the people who do all that um, uh, blue sky stuff and the stock exchange stuff and securities and exchange commission motions and filings. And, and there's people who do insurance law. You see them on TV every day. Right. You know, all those guys, you know, those who do, do the ambulance people and whatnot. I saw a great billboard on the turnpike the other day and it said such and such law firm ambulances chase us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> In my day, Brian, and this is an interesting little note, they didn't allow lawyer advertising. So really? it all came to be, yeah, absolutely, it all came to be in like 1980. But back in the late 70s and whatnot, you actually were not allowed to advertise. And I remember when it all started, there was big debate in Tallahassee and in other state capitals all about how far are we going to let these people go. And they had guidelines. And it was just like, you know, I am the law firm of John and Adon. I specialize in it. I am certified by the Florida Bar. Thank you. It was just supposed to be that stuff. Sure. But obviously, it's, uh, hey, he got me $2 million. Yeah, like, exactly. Oh my God. <laughs> So it's, it's gotten crazy. And also in my day in Florida, there were only four law schools. There was you know, U of F, FSU, Florida, Stetson. Nova was just coming into being, and today there are almost 14 law schools in Florida. Wow. So you're cranking out a whole lot of lawyers for the state 
and it's like it's pretty saturated you know that whole market so i'm happy i i did my time i transitioned into what i love arts you know acting music i'm lucky i'm out of it now <laughs> sure sure you did i love you did your time <laughs> there's a pun there <laughs> Yeah, they, I, my clients did some time, but I did more time <laughs> than any go. of my clients. Look at it that way. Right? I there worked in the business for 35 years. I don't think I had a single client who was ever sent away <laughs> for more than, than 30 years. That's a terrible way to look at it. That's anyway. your advertisement right there. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I worked longer that's than right. anyone. Who I, I guarantee I I'll do more time than you. <laughs> um, but I loved, I loved what I did. I was very, very dedicated. I was always... Uh, the first to try to relate to my clients, you know, get their trust. And it's tough. It's tough when you're defending like some really bad boys. I bet. And they're in the prison and you walk in that jail cell and it's like, you know, who's this guy? You know, what are you going to do for me, man? Sure. It's always it's that attitude. And you really have to ingratiate yourself one way or the other, like find some common ground. A lot of times music. Oh, you I know? bet. Yeah, smart. Well, and I had a ponytail back in those days. And they'd say, hey, there man, you go. that's a ponytail. You're that musician, lawyer. They would say, <laughs> yes, I am, as a matter of fact, you know. But there were many times when conversations, I'm a big Motown freak. And I yeah. was, a lot of things. It was things I could, you know, talk to about clients sometimes, different types of music and whatnot. And guys, heavy metal guys who would come in, you know, from the white supremacist uh, groups. I at least could talk to them about right, yeah. <laughs> before getting to the uh, the crux of their case there. So, yeah, sure. interesting life experience there, Brian. Do you get to pick your clients as a lawyer? Or? Not, no. In where I was, we were doing court-appointed work. So most of the time, like public defense. Gotcha. And so most of the time, you are given the load. And so people always say, you know, how do you defend that guy? In my case, it was pretty, that was the job. Right. I mean, being an emergency room doctor, you're in you're in the emergency room. You don't know who they're going to bring in with a gunshot wound. Was he the bad guy or was he the guy killing the guy? You know, sure. You still treat him, and you know, and when you do that kind of work, it's it's kind of that that mentality. You know, unfortunately, it, it's like it's like the triage. You know, yeah. mentality. It's like they're coming in. A lot of people, a lot of caseload. What can we do for them? Is you know, you know, you got to give them a shot. Sure. That's pretty interesting because, like, like I said, I have no context for it. So, yeah, you get a, a firm with lawyers. So it's like in your Miranda rights when it's like one will be provided for you. You got it. The ones. That's, oh, okay. that's the one. But that, that, part of the uh, Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, you have the right to counsel. On. Yes, and that's where it comes from. And it's, um, you know, but they take it real seriously there in the halls of justice. But Lenny Bruce once said, the only justice in the halls of justice is out in the halls. Yeah. <laughs> now, tell you what, Brian, there's a little bit of truth to Can that, confirm. Too. Oh, yeah. A lot of, lot of mornings you're out there in the hall with the prosecutor wheeling and dealing. It's like, look, he wasn't that bad. Why don't you drop this count and just give me that count? Maybe he can plead to that count. You take this away and give him probation and he won't have to do this. Or, sure. You know, a lot of whole, negotiations. May, my father was a car salesman. Oh, and perfect. I've, <laughs> I've, I've often thought that I have the gene <laughs> somewhere. Yep. Yep. In me of car sales, I was just selling a product called Reasonable Doubt. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> there you is go. My, that was my product that I sold, and I think I did it pretty well. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to have left it. It gives me some inspiration and some, you know, acting I gigs. bet. I bet. Anything, yeah, I, bet. I mean, that's the job of an actor is to relate to another human being as a human Absolutely. being. And Absolutely. the more experience you have, the better you can convey experience. And you have so much. Com I, I, have, I have portrayed, you know, child killers and i've portrayed mob guys and and drug guys and whatnot and and yeah i have can context. do a little bit of contact a little bit of familiarity there from those folks yeah, yeah. so that's a big help too but you know it's, it's interesting being uh, the transition now that i'm a full-time actor you know it's a different like scheduling like yeah. law <laughs> you know this hearing is on Tuesday at two o'clock. If you're not there, they put you in jail for contempt. Bam. Yep. <laughs> Acting. Be on call at seven a.m. You know, sit, sit around so <laughs> four thirty till you're called to do your scene. Yep. Yeah, it's really different. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you say call time five thirty in the morning. Wrap at six thirty yep. at night. Never shot your scene. <laughs> Absolutely. It's happened to me, too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's very common. But I understand that's the whole creative thing. Yeah, of course. And as a musician, 
I could always understand that nobody could ever rush me into writing a song or doing right. something. Like that. So I understand when you're directing a movie, no one should rush you into doing things and how many shots you have to get done in within an hour. Although the the ADs do pretty good, like the AD that we had at our shoot a couple of weeks ago. He was pretty good at staying on top of things. Like, oh, hey, yeah. we wasted five minutes setting this light up. Now yep. move. On, you know. Exactly. Exactly. So that's that's cool, but it's a different mindset, obviously, than than law or any other professions. You know, it's just that's just different. It's, and I've learned to accept that. At first, I was a bit impatient, especially because <laughs> I started out, I was doing like extra work. Yep, same. You know, so, right? And we talked about it. I was on other you know, shows like Ballers and then a little featured part here and there. And you're waiting around and you see the time that these very high-paid professionals waste. You know, a lot of these guys and the directors arguing with the cameraman and about angles and shots and the grips are arguing. It's not just all, you know, bam, bam. It doesn't happen like that. You know, there's a lot of give and take in, those, in that process. Yeah, for sure. It's a, and it's so collaborative. There's so many people involved that it's yeah. not just like two people move a light and then you get it handled. It's like right. a department. Right. Yeah. It's it, and so I've, I've really gained a, a lot of respect, a lot more than I used to have as, as sort of an outsider because musicians sort of look at actors like, oh, well, come on, you know, we have to write songs, we have to record then. You just say lines of other people. You know, so there's like a little attitude. But you see, look how many musicians, you know, in life have tran- transitioned to acting. Yeah. You know. Hundreds and hundreds of people have done that, and Judy Garland, Sinatra, these people were singers, they became actors, it was, you know, just a whole bunch of people, what's it, Justin Timberlake's been in movies, people do it all the time. You know, there's some similarities, definitely, because you're expressing yourself, you know, it's all expression. It's true. You know? And you're using different voices, like I, I, I use accents. Yeah. You know, so it's more of a musical thing because I was always good at picking up sounds and accents and you know way people speak in different parts of the country and the world. So it all comes to a, a big head when I finally get to combine it all. As yeah, an actor. I love how like the synergy between all the things that you wouldn't think a lawyer, a musician, and an oh. actor would have that much overlap. Yeah, exactly, and Pretty and neat. they do, and they do. It's just it's just the people who just do like one or the other are the ones that sometimes have a hard under- time understanding that many people do both and they do them fine. Sure. But there's, there's those of the mindset, the same with acting, like, you know, well, this guy, he's just a retired lawyer guy. You know, what kind of actor is he? You know, and then you get, you know, lawyers, you know, who say, you know, what's this person? Oh, he's a musician. What kind of lawyer can he be? Sure. Everyone it. wants to pigeonhole you because it's easier. To, it. It's easier to understand if you put somebody that's... in a box. You're like, this is what you are, and then that's they right. can accept it easier as opposed to seeing a person as multi-layered, multifaceted. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's like, if you want to, you know, and, and that's fine. That's always been my moniker. You want to call me Renaissance man? I'll take it. Yeah. You yeah. know, I'll take offense. <laughs> That's cool. I'll do a little bit of everything, but I'd like to think I do it well. Yeah. You know? so that's, I mean, it worked out. <laughs> yeah, right? You did some, right. some pretty cool things. Yeah, so, so far, so good. So what's harder, writing an original song where you play all the instruments or the bar? Uh, oh, good question. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you're acting. That's what I do. Thing. I get you comfortable, and then I do yeah, a hard left ah. turn. <laughs> or the bar. Uh, the bar. Yeah. Oh, that studying and that stuff and uh, – I was in a hurry to get out of law school because, frankly, I didn't have a lot of money. Right. So I was financing myself. So I did it in a little over two years instead of the usual three. Nice. So I had to then, you know, get into that bar thing even before my other classmates did. And it takes, as any lawyer will tell you, it's like a four or five month process literally studying really? for this exam. You literally spend like three, four or five months for this one exam that takes three days to take. Wow. And uh, yeah, and that that was definitely one of the most uh, um, stressful times of my life, no, bar none. Huh? Yeah, that's yeah, it's a pain. It's a big pain. Any lawyer will tell you that it's not easy. It's a pain, and they're very. They keep raising the score, the necessary scores in states to. It's like I was saying before, the fourteen law schools in Florida. Yeah, yeah. Don't 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 discount the fact that there's some people saying, "Hmm, we don't want them all to be lawyers." Wait a minute. <laughs> sure. Let's raise the score you need on the multi-state bar exam to get into Florida. And that's what happened, is every year they oh, inch the state okay. up. I think the, the maximum score is like, I don't know, 150 or something. And they, they started at like 110 and 125, and now it's like 138. And, one, and you get closer to that maximum score, whatever it is. 
but yeah, that's what they do. So uh, yeah, it was a tough thing to get in. I was always happy yeah. with it. I was, you know, made it a decent living, not a great living, but now I'm enjoying my life a lot more because I just get to be creative now. Yeah, you get to do that side of you. Like I said, you did your time. I'm yep. always wondering because, like, I, I think you're the only person I've ever talked to who's taken the bar. Just taken uh, it. Never mind passed it. So I was like, what is that test? Being that you're a lawyer and a lot of it is in court, like, is there parts of the test that is, like, public speaking sort of thing or it's all? That's an excellent yeah. question, young man. And I'll tell you well, what. I think no. you. <laughs> the answer is no. And this is something that some uh, legal organizations, ABA type people, have addressed in the past. Oh. It has absolutely nothing to do with your speaking skills. It has a little bit to do with writing because, yeah, you have to write long essay answers to these various questions besides multiple choice stuff. But, yes, and there are some people who think there should be some sort of a speaking component. But, you know, keep in mind, a lot of lawyers don't have to speak a lot. You know, oh, they just are looking at the insurance company, Paperwork. filing the claims. Yeah. So they're not real, you know, speaker, public speakers. But a lot of the public feels that a lawyer, no matter what he or she is doing, when you get on the phone and you're talking to a client, you know, know how to express yourself. Hello. Good point. Yeah. And so that that happens. But yeah, that, that's a I know a, a bit of a debate that goes on about whether law school should encompass, you know, more of those skills. So for me, that all came from my acting and music background. None of that was taught to me in law sure. school. Sure. At wow. all. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. You learn like the rules of evidence. You know, you learn the, the game, you know, the game rules of how to play the game, what's admissible, or objections to me. You learn all that Perry Mason stuff. Sure. But but how to speak and how to argue and how to convince people and what angle you're not you're not taught that very very little trial skills classes you know for maybe a few weeks but nothing like that huh was there a learning curve because you you chose to be a lawyer on just like pretty much a random whim and it wasn't then, then you picked right. law school which is you know arguably one of the hardest things you can do I, I used to as a kid so I go to medical school so for me it was like oh. a step. <laughs> I was always good. And I was, I, I, unfortunately, I was good academically. I was a good book learner. But yeah, so law school is like, yeah, okay. But yeah, my first choice would have been going to medical school, but that's way too much. That's and eight that years whole, of school. There's no, <laughs> yeah. law is seven, right? Medical is eight. But there's no comparing uh, the dedication and the time that doctors have to spend as compared to lawyers. I don't care who you are as a lawyer. I don't care who's going to argue that. Doctors, from the get-go, yeah. spend many more hours at the whole residency, internship, and on-call, and the yeah. hospital, much more than starting lawyers do. And they, they're they paid uh, commensurate with that. You know, they, yeah, they make for sure. more money than starting lawyers do. But there's a reason for that. And so I have all the respect in the world for people who go into those fields or the sciences. Those are much more complicated, I think, you know, than a lot of law, you know. Sure. Makes sense. I, was, yeah. I always wonder as well when you ta when you go to school for something that's so specific and then when you actually get into it, you know, mm -hmm. it's like you can study all day long, but then like taking an acting class, right? You can study acting all day long, but once you get on set, it's like, okay, Absolutely. this is different. I'm um, wondering right. like how did it take you a while to get into the swing of law versus acting and the learning curve between the two? Right. No, fortunately, no. It was it was it was pretty smooth transition. Yeah. It was a smooth transition. It was a lot of work. First, I used to be uh, an avid reader. You know, I love literature, and I was always reading books and ma magazines and things back in the day when you read you know things on paper. But when I went to law school, and you have to read literally two, three hundred pages a night, oh. you know, of all your different case book, Good it Lord. totally killed my appetite for reading. I bet. And so. And then when you become a lawyer, you're reading all this stuff, you know, every day to keep up with the new case law and whatnot. And they send you to various seminars and you read for those. And it killed my appetite for reading. Some people it doesn't, but me, no, I couldn't read. I and just now, yeah, after retiring from that life, I can start reading again for pleasure. Sure. But it's been a long time. I, I bet. Good Lord. Two, three hundred pages a night? Absolutely. Yeah. It'll ruin me. It'll ruin you. You stay there, and that's what. And I, since I did it in less time than most people, I was, you know, doubling up summers, you know, double loads of classes and all that to oh. get there. After a little over two years, so that was even more reading, and it just killed, it killed Good my. Lord.
Lord. And it's right. not like it's fun reading. <laughs> you're not reading yeah. like a it's novel not. where you're like, oh, this is great with characters. It's just yeah, yeah. No. And then you have to be you know, there at 8 o'clock the next morning, able to summarize, as I say, brief the case for you know, some loudmouth professor who calls you out, hey, you, in row three, yeah. you know, Shelley V. Ferguson, what was the holding? How many members of the Supreme Court disagreed? Oh, it's like, oh, oh. my God. But yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I understand. Yes. You did your time. <laughs> yeah. There so, you then, go. so then you retired from that, and that was when you were like, okay, it's acting time. Let's do this. Or was it that and then music? Exactly. Or did you do both and both? I did, no, I was doing both simultaneously. My last five, six years as a lawyer, I had produced my second album, which is the one that actually did pretty well. Cool. And then I started doing more acting, mostly extra work in those days. And of course, I had to use sick time, you know, vacation time. Yep. And I had to tell my secretary, you know, I'm taking off tomorrow. Oh, you're not feeling well? No, I'm working with uh, Dwayne Johnson in Ballers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody, but that's what I have to do. But I'm sick tomorrow. Right. You, know, so that's, uh, I, you know, would have to take days like that sometimes to do this. But never to interfere with the work or anything. But there were times when, yeah. And you can't do it. And people know in acting, you can't be an actor and have a full-time job. How do you go to auditions? It's true. Right? Absolutely I had, true. An, I had an agent this morning call me up at 10 o'clock and say, oh, can you be at you know this such and such place for this audition this afternoon? And you know what I had to tell her? Absolutely. No. I had to say... <laughs> I'm meeting Brian Balance <laughs> on his show today, so I can't go to your audition. And <laughs> she just scratched your name off of her list of clients. Yeah, but it was a pleasure, Brian. It was a pleasure because that's what, you know, gigs, you know, conflict with gigs. So I said, no, no, I, I, have, a, I have a date with Brian today on his podcast. That's right. So I never went to that audition. I can tell you, Brian, I could <laughs> My whole career. Yeah, that I mean... would have been the audition that made me the new Travago guy. You know what? I did know that that was coming. I also know the dark side of Travago, so you're welcome. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. None because of that I, is true. I think the specs on this one, honestly, Brian. I don't no, go ahead. Clear yourself. Yeah. <laughs> just did a disclaimer. I'm a lawyer, man. I can appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm, I'm just covering. You know what I mean? Like this, yeah, what friends no, no do. No offense to yeah. Travago yeah. or the subsidiaries thereof, yes, of or course. the holding company or corporation which manages it. Thank you very much. Boom. No, I'm they, gonna have you won't... on every episode now, just in case, because I say all kinds of stuff that is definitely evidence. <laughs> that's, it. that's it. Copyright. Yeah, Don't... exactly. You no, know, that's the thing with. Uh, I think they wanted a guy. This was a gig today. I think it was that somebody will like the Travago guy. It's like, oh, okay. But yeah. for some reason, I think she wanted to send me, but. I said no, no. There but go. there you go. So <laughs> at least when you're when you're when you don't have a full time job, then you you can have the freedom to yep. make choices like that. Oh, I'd rather do this, you know, gig here than that gig. So that's what I mean. It's true. It's true. That's why I've been really lucky because I work nights. Right. You're telling me. Yep. So I'm like, all right, this will work. I mean, I get no sleep. But who needs any of that? I mean, let's be right, honest. Right. You know, sleep. Huh? Yeah. Push. Exactly. I've heard of it. Maybe. Right. I think other people get it. I don't know. Well, <laughs> you know, you're young. You're That's young. right. Yes. Dude, it's okay. That's right. You can't tell. I'm actually only 15. But... <laughs> no, yes. It's just not the growth. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not the years. It's the mileage, you know. <laughs> did you? Let me ask you. Did you enjoy the project that you and I worked on a couple of weeks ago in Naples? Oh, I loved it, man. It was a good time. Yeah. It was a good set. A... I mean, the crew was awesome. It was really fun. The parts were all cool. We got yeah. to meet, which is an added bonus. Yeah. Right? And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about the acting world is because, and we joke about it, because of all the time you have on set. Yep. And I've heard many stories about famous actors and what they do. For instance, Gary Cooper, okay? Mm -hmm. You may not know this, but old Gary Cooper was a master at falling asleep on uh, in a second. Oh, and sweet. And it was during the setups on set he would know that he could sleep for those 20, 25 minutes. And they say the guy could, like, knock himself out immediately, and he would sleep during all those, you know, bulky lighting and camera setups in those days. That's what he would do. So, But, no, uh, in, the, in today's world, we all sit around and chat. Yep. And it's very I, – I love it. It's great until they tell you to shut up because they can hear you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Picked up in the microphones. But aside from that, you meet great people, and yeah, so it's, it's a great opportunity to sit and, and network and all that good stuff. Yeah, because yeah, that's the other thing is like the people that you meet on a set nine out of ten times are working on other things well. 
Absolutely. So you're just meeting possible future collaborators, and it's just cool. All, Everyone's been cool. All the time. I, 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 love, I love that aspect of it. So, man, I, one thing, I, many things, that I didn't like about the practice of law, frankly, is I didn't like a lot of lawyers. I bet. You know? I bet. Right? Yeah. That personality type. And some people say, well, you're one. But, man, I was, I was a guitar player. Yeah. Was, <laughs> you're a rock star lawyer. All right? <laughs> I played with some famous people, and I've been around the country before I became a lawyer, you know. And it's like that – my ego is filled there. I'm not going to be a lawyer and go huff and puff about what I do. And I'll tell you something, man. You talk about egos. Trial lawyers in particular and judges, they, they beat out most actors in ego, in the ego department. I bet. These people are, are quite convinced of their saintliness. Yeah, yeah. What they do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got, you can imagine 30, 35 years of being around a lot of people like that. You know, all the bragging and, like, oh, I really made that witness cry on the stand. Yeah, you're proud of that. That's really nice. Yeah, you know, to tell a lot. Oh, that, oh that judge, I told that judge, screw you, I'm filing this motion anyway. And it's like, okay, fine. How did how much did that get your client? You know, who, who Yeah, saw? for real. What was it's, your job again? <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot, not all, because many nice lawyers, but there's a lot in the trial business. And I guess it's, you know, maybe it comes with the territory, but they have to sort of be bigger than life. Sure. You know, be convinced of themselves and their ability. But some of them are way over the top. And so I haven't met a single actor that had any bigger ego, you know, sure, than yeah, yeah. a lawyer I've never known or judge. That's another one. Yeah. Right. So that doesn't bother me. So when I meet people on set, some of them, you know, this are very big braggarts. Yep. And oh, they'll yeah. sit there, you know, I just did the new Downey Snow commercial. And oh, yeah, well, I was in the McDonald's last week. And you get people and you find out it was their elbow. Yep. You know, that was yep, in the exactly. yeah. <laughs> It was just their elbow. They were an extra with a hundred other people. Yep. You, know, but you, you hear that, and I'm never one to do that. I, um, you'll never hear me on set. Just I'll tell funny stories or yep. something, but Same. never about, you know, look what I did. You know, it's, there's other places. It's for your resume, you know, your post and your special Facebook page or something, what you're doing. But I don't sit there and, you know, converse with people and, and try to one-up them. But I noticed even on our little set where we worked there, there were a couple of people, I remember that first night, who, like, really laid it on thick. Yeah. You know, yeah. what they <laughs> did, what big commercial they were in. You know, okay, I got it, you know. Sure, sure. I don't do that. I remember the guy turned to me and he said, so you, J.J., what? I said, no. I've done about 200 things in the last five years. I don't know. What do you want to know about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that really, that what he didn't my... know is you have a giant book in your back pocket. You're like, flip through, pick one. I'll talk about yeah, it. Go ahead. <laughs> so I, I don't answer that. You know, I don't get with those people. But, but you know, people are like, and sometimes, you know, it's insecurities with any job. Yep. But for the most part, I love the people I meet in the business. I like sound people. I always Same. chum up to the sound guy on set. Oh, because- yes. I'm into all that technology. You know, I got Pro Tools at home and the sound studio, so I love to see what they're working with, what mics they're using and all. I'm, I'm really into that stuff. Same. I like when I have a lav set up and I can, like, <laughs> send secret messages to the sound department. So all the time, in between takes, I'll just whisper into my shirt, be like, this is for yep. the sound department. You guys yep. are doing a really good job. And then I'll look for the boom operator for him to recognize and be like, where's that uh-huh. coming from? We'll make eye uh-huh. contact. Right. It's fun. Very good. And sometimes that can be embarrassing. Yep. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Been there. Is, the the <laughs> lavalier mic yep. is on when the transmitter isn't turned off and you're in the back and you're talking about something you shouldn't be talking about. Or, yep. you know, or you got to go to the bathroom. Oh, yeah. Stuff <laughs> is going on and you forget, oh, my God, this guy's listening to all this stuff. Yep. You know? Yeah, yep. all the time. You come back after you pee, and then you're like looking at them, and they just have their eyes kind of wide open. You're like, right. I'm sorry, guys. Ah, that was an Austin Powers pee yeah, there. That's right. <laughs> it's a healthy Holy stream, God. my friend. <laughs> I, I heard that whole thing for 10 minutes. That's right. Ah, yes, the little <laughs> so little cool. difficulties that come with the flip. But yeah. I like most people I work with. Same. That's fun. If you can just talk, that's the other thing that's really fun in any sort of environment. And that's pretty much what my whole show is about, is connecting with people as people. It's right. like the work is great, and that's what we know you from, but who's the person behind the work? You know what I mean? As opposed right. to just posturing about these are all the cool things I've done. It's like, okay, cool, but who are you I agree. that's doing and these I, things? Right. It's not what are you, it's who are you. Yeah. It's not who are and all that. I'm, I'm a big, big believer. And when I was a lawyer, that was how many times I'd meet people – 
because I was playing clubs on the South Beach and doing all that stuff you know, as a lawyer. I was opening shows for Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids and, and the Mavericks and stuff. And I uh, never, I never would tell most of them that I was a lawyer. Sure. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to blend the two. I didn't want them to think I had some attitude or something. You know, right. so I very seldom talked. It was just the people like in my band, you know, or some friends that would come that knew. But I, I never made a big deal about it. But some people said, "Oh, you'll do a contract for me, Marilyn." In fact, it was, his name was Brian. We did a gig um, at a place in Howendale, and it was uh, like 1991. It was right before he got discovered by Trent Reznor, and we did the gig where he was discovered, and it was at a place called the Button South, nice. and it was like, it was, it was like the big Miami uh, music showcase, like the top, you know, 10 bands in Miami, and my band was one of them, and we played there, and he played there, and I, I remember very well Trent Reznor was there in the audience, Ooh. and I remember people pointing, they said, hey man, you see that? That's Trent Reznor talking over there to Marilyn Manson, and that's apparently where some of their connection was made. They could have met before that, sure. but he was there, they said, and uh, the rest is history, as they say, so that was kind of interesting, so I had, you know, there was a crowd I hung out with, and they weren't too into lawyers or yeah. <laughs> stuff like that, <laughs> suits, as they would call them. Yeah. So I didn't make a big deal about that. I was happy I didn't, you know. Yeah, that's fair. And it's so uh, usually diametrically opposed things to have as well, yeah. to have those sides of you. You know, I suppose when you have, yeah. like, an actor and a musician, like you said, they're both artists. I, There's a way that you can very easily believe, okay, yeah, one person can be those two things. But right. the, <laughs> the groups of law versus creatives usually isn't the same. But you know now, Brian, and it, I've observed this, now – it's becoming a little more commonplace. When I went to law school, no, there were not many other rock and roll guitar player lawyers. There right. were a few, not many with ponytails, no. Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, I see on the news, there's a heart surgeon who's a heavy metal shredding guitar player, and there's bands of bankers, and, and now it's much more common because people have been brought up on the music and the technology. But uh, back back in the old days, yeah. when dinosaurs roamed the earth, yeah. Back in those days, it was not common, and so it was weird to have a guy who's this, you know, working musician playing with, you know, big bands and opening shows, and he's also a lawyer. You know, that was weird, and people, you know, sometimes got weird about it. Yeah. <laughs> it was theirs. Right. But, um, you know, so yeah, that's always been a duality that I dealt with, but I'm happy that's that's behind me. Yeah, it's and pretty cool be, that it happened, though. Gives you good yeah. stories, you know. It, I could I could write a script. Oh, I could meet if I met some you know some script writer who's interested. I could write a few stories from what I've been through. There, there you know? go. <laughs> now we just got to brainstorm a title. I think I right. mean, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to come up with. So okay. so you can help me with that, Brian. You help done. Me. I mean, if, right. if you want to tank it, I'm your guy. <laughs> okay. We'll okay. take we'll take your idea and run it right into the ground. Because I know you do other production work. You do other things. I mean, I try my best. You know, yeah, I doubt that's cool. And we've got to get together and have some synergy between us and put our collaborative, creative uh, minds together. You know, absolutely. I I honestly yeah. believe that uh, film, TV, anything in the entertainment industry is one of the most collaborative arts possible. Yes. Because there's so many people involved in it yeah. that if anything gets made at all, it's a miracle. If it's, it's good, true. it's a double miracle. Right. I you always know. like, you know, at the end of movies, right, when you stay for all the credits and especially these big productions and whatnot, and you see the hundreds of names. I love it. You'll see these Same. German and French and Indian names and Chinese names and all these people who got together and built the sets for all these movies. And I love watching all that, you know, just the, the blend of humanity that goes into creating a film like that. Yeah. 100% agreed. And like visual effects houses, you're like, here's 300 people that worked on oh, one sure. effect. I'm like, this is the greatest thing ever. Right. Oh, The Simpsons, right? It's done in Korea. Yeah. The names of the Korean people who do all the artwork and what. I think that's great. It's amazing. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing, art, and I, I just wish I would have had more time, you know, in the earlier part of my life to devote to it. I tried. I did some things, but now I'm, I'm going full force. So yeah, no, I, and you've got yeah. the experience behind it because, you know, that's yeah. like we said, that's the thing is you can you can play a part and you can act, but there's something different if you have something inside of you that you can bring out and Complete. have context for because you can fake it all day long and some people are damn good at faking it, but right. if it's real, you're not right. faking it. You can just bring it out. 
And that's like writers, right? They say like great writers. And yep. Hemingway has to say only write about that which you know. Right. You know, it's there's a lot of truth to that. I sometimes I'm more uncomfortable playing an acting role that I know absolutely nothing about. You know, and yep. occasionally, like I had a thing where I had to do like a southern preacher not long ago. I had to go up to Orlando and do this big audition and whatnot. And I thought to myself, wow, these are people I really don't know much about, other than the stereotype, you right. know, just TV and movies. But I don't even I don't know any Southern preachers. I've never met one in a jail cell. Yeah. Oh, like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Let me correct that. No. Okay. What kind I of preacher? That. On trial yes. or non? <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, yes. And he was accused of uh, uh, molesting some girls in his parish. And yeah. So anyway, Ooh. but as far as <laughs> I've never known, known any You don't know pre- if that's the kind of preacher they wanted. So you didn't. Right. That's I a hard think, swing to commit to. <laughs> oh, I put, put my mouth with that one. Yeah, okay, but yes, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. For instance, I'll give you, I'll give you a good, clean example. Yeah. <laughs> I went to an audition. A casting sent me to to be an airline pilot, right? Yes. And they wanted me to play the role of this pilot, and so they take me to the casting, and there's this German director, this woman, a fairly famous woman. I forgot who she was, and uh, I do the part, and she pulls me aside, and she says to me, "Listen, no offense, but you don't look like." An airline pilot. You're, you're not a pilot. What are you doing? And I said, you know, listen, master, they called me here. She says, and she says to me, you know, if I'm doing a, a mob movie or something, you know, I'll call you. I'm doing like a Russian accent, but she was from German, East German. Okay. And, and it, literally she said that to my face and I thought, you know, she's right. I don't look like an airline pilot. I know nothing about being a pilot. Just what little glimpse I've seen on TV. So why do I even try for that? So I, so I restricted myself from a lot of roles. If I like you say, if I can't identify with it personally in some remote way, at least, yep. I'm not going to try out for it. So that's that's my new rule lately. So it's smart. It's smart. It's because that's the other thing is you you'd almost be doing a disservice to the role. Like oh yeah. Trying to fit you know a square peg in a circle hole kind of thing. I'll tell you, exa- another thing is, for instance, when they have uh, certain roles, they say, "Well, you look Hispanic." You know, yeah. <laughs> play this, this, you know, Puerto Rican guys. Get, no, I have too many Hispanic friends and, you know, people in my family. No, I'm not going to insult them. Yeah. By, I'm not anywhere. I wasn't born half Hispanic. I can't use that, you know. So, no. Yeah, I was half Italian. You know, I can play the Italians. I was half Russian. I can play the Russians. You know? Sure, sure. Hispanic, yeah. no. It's like me playing, you know, an Asian guy. I'm just, that's not going to happen. So. Right, right. <laughs> I, I let them know that. There you go. There you go. Do, do what you know, and then do it really, really well. You know that's what I mean? Try to do. I, that's my credo. I try yeah. to do a few different things, but I try to do them all well. Yeah, you know? it's a, it's a better way to go. It's sort of like yeah. spreading yourself too thin and doing everything at thirty percent. Do what you right. know. Do it a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Yields absolutely. a better result, I think. So, yeah. what sort of advice would you give to someone who wants to get into like the three things? So, like a lawyer, a musician, <laughs> and an actor, because you've oh, been boy. through it. Yeah, I have been. All right. Uh, for law, yeah. I would advise uh, people, you really have to like reading. You really have to like people, especially what I did. It was like a criminal law. You really have to like people, and many, even when people don't like you. Like Fair. the jury doesn't like you because you're the big bad defense lawyer. Sure. The client doesn't like you because he's this dude who's been in prison half his life and doesn't trust anybody. Fair. You know? So you have to really like people, and you have to be pretty good academically. As far as music goes... Practice, practice, (laughs) and don't expect money. Do it for the love of doing it. And as far as acting goes, it's a wonderful thing that's either in you or it's not. I'm convinced that people who don't have it in them just can't wake up one day and be actors. It's like music. You really do have to have some of that in you, at least a tonality. Acting, you've got to have a sense of expression, of knowing your emotions, something you know, you can't be a total flat person, and maybe some people are, and they put it on well. I don't know. But you really have to have that in you. Law, you don't have to have in you. That's an sure, exercise. Yeah. <laughs> like people, do a lot of work. You know, yeah, you want to do that, fine. But acting and music, I think, are more, uh, you know, innate abilities that you then foster, are fostered through your life, your childhood, you know, that you try to better yourself with and always become better at what you do at that particular talent. No. Yeah, I think you're right. Actually, that's a good point because it's 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 outward, so it has to be inside first to that's convey right. it properly. Whereas law, it's a lot of you, like you got to like people, but oh, yeah. as far as memorization, like it's a lot more I, having to know and argue the rules better. 
like taking what? it into your brain as opposed to putting it out of your brain. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. It's Acting like- it comes from the brain out. Whereas law, medicine, you know, the sciences, there are many other things. It's like how much can your brain absorb? And sure. Take in? You put it in and then be right. able to spit it back out. Right. There's a big, obviously, there's a big difference. Yeah. You know, Makes you know. sense. It's like dance because you either have the movement or you have two left feet. And it's going to be real difficult, which you can, I guess, with the amount of schooling, you can kind of meet it halfway, but you still will only get to a point where if you don't have good coordination, your feet aren't right. going to move the way they're supposed to. Two you dance. Know, yeah, and it's there's something. I was thinking just back a, a second ago, we were talking about acting. I've met people, and I know you have too, who don't want to be actors necessarily, but they do background work. Yes, and that is their. We were, you and I spoke about this on set, right? That's their thing. Yeah. I know people who drive around the state of Florida, and they're just background performers in an Orlando production, then a Miami production, and then they're just the husband and wife that you see sitting at the bar type of thing. I know a number of people who are just happy doing that. Yep, same. And there, you don't have to have any big acting skills. You have to be able to look like a person and not exaggerate. Right. But, yeah. <laughs> Can't have flat both, arms. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> but if, in order for your elbow to be seen it's in that like show, elbow, man. <laughs> you, know, you can do that. Now, that's something, and you can make money. You know, Orlando, they pay really cheap, but I know Miami, it's about $120 a day, yep. you know, for extra work. And people, it's a 12-hour day, and people do that. They spend you, you're in a big tent, and I've done it. You eat nice yeah. food. Right. Then you go out for 40 minutes of shooting and you sit around for four more hours and 30 minutes of shooting. Right? But it's cool. Yeah, you know, it's they fun. have to have a lot of talent, per se, to do it. You know, so that's always open to people. I tell people that some people I know who have retired, I say, hey, why don't you try to get some extra work? It's just fun to do. Yeah, if it's a good way to spend a day. Right. Exactly. So that's a, a, a part of acting anybody can do. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There are the, like a. Uh... It's also fun just to be on those sort of sets and like look around and see what's going on. Like, it's a good way to spend a day. It pays yes. well. Why not? Right. Absolutely. I agree. That's I cool. learned a lot by doing that. And I, I always, my first few years, I did a lot of that extra work, stand-in work. So you yeah. and I let's discuss this real quick. Yeah. Here's a little, t- a little behind-the-scenes right? tidbit. <laughs> we were both stand-ins uh, for the actor uh, Richard. Um, Richard Schiff. Richard Schiff in the show Ballers. Yep. So how many episodes did you do with him? I did just the one, actually. Because okay. I, wor- I was on Ballers four days, and right. one of those days was stand-in. I got you. And stand-in's I did. way better. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. You and I talked I, I did it for several days. I was a stand-in over a several-day period. And it was interesting because you're right up there with the director and the people. Yep. Although, as you and I spoke about, sometimes, you know, the stars themselves don't want to have anything to do with you anyway, whether yep. you're a show or a stand-in. So it's not like that. Although I know I worked with Sissy Spacek on uh, Bloodline. Yeah. I, w- I was just a piano player for a scene, and they told me, you know, don't talk to the star. Don't talk to the star. Okay, okay. And it was about 2.30 in the morning. And we had been working over and over the same thing. And she started leaning on my piano and she was all, and I just looked up at her and I just said, Hey, how you doing tonight, ma'am? Yeah. And, every, and everybody looked at me and said, Oh my God, JJ spoke to the star. Right. Ooh, <laughs> he did it. <laughs> and God bless. She turned around and she said, you know, thank you for asking. I'm doing pretty good, but we're all a little tired. All right, you now, blah, blah, blah. And she just started this conversation. What a lovely person. And there I said, oh, I spoke to Sissy Spacek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you go back, you fools. Right. All you needed was a piano. <laughs> right, exactly. So you had some reason to talk to me. But no, I know you're not supposed to. So you, you get a weird impression of some of these people, you know, not to name any names. But when you're on set with some people and you expect them because you're working with them to say maybe, you know, good morning, you know, or something, and, and they don't, you know. So that's part of being an extra and a stand-in that's, you know, you're kind of a piece of furniture. Yep, you know, a living problem. Stay, right? <laughs> yep. And uh, I got that impression pretty early in the game. And I said, I don't really like this much. I want to do speaking roles. You know, I want to be a part of the film. I don't want to do this. And so that was a choice I made. And you just have to work harder. Sure. Go to more auditions, learn more lines. That's true. And another little overlap, piano. Yeah. There you go. Boom. That piano got me my first job. Look <laughs> at you. Show. Was the piano? You're exactly right, Brian. That's See? exactly. That's how I was booked. That's I was the service booking. I provide. Is I just uh-huh. run you through the threads you of your life. 
I just did an ad and it was like 350 people tried out for this ad. They only picked like 20 of us. Yeah. They picked me as the piano player on the cruise ship. <laughs> Boom. See, there we go. So, you're going to see this commercial and there I am. It's like a 70. I'm not going to give it away. Anyway, <laughs> you'll see me playing the piano, these beautiful models and these strange clothes around us and, and yeah, so piano right. guy. Got That's me right. If people will watch it and be like, is that the piano guy from Bloodline? Right, right. Yeah, he's the same guy. Wait a minute. How there you go. Him? They can start their own theories <laughs> of how Bloodline yes. and this commercial are connected. <laughs> We're all related. That's so, right. You'll you, have you, your own universe. That's funny. Yeah, but all experience is always good, so I'm always happy for every gig I get. But uh, I like the dramatic roles, and that's a lot more. Than yeah, others. of course. It's more meat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like it. I like it a lot. Can you believe we've been talking for over an hour already? Boom. <laughs> oh, really? Pretty good. Yeah, not bad. Not bad Pretty at good. all. Uh, you suckered me into this thing. I gave up ah, a huge casting. That's that right. could have got me the job of my life. It could have, yeah. It could have. Oh, no, no, it's that's really right. a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> so are you online at all? Do you have any like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, any of that? Facebook. Yeah. Facebook, Facebook JJ Crown. Uh, I have a Twitter account. Yes. And uh, I don't use it. I have an Instagram account. They're all JJ Crown, C-R-O-W-N-E Crown. So that's where I am. And my music is on yes. uh, www.jjcrown.com. And those are um, songs from my album and stuff that I always keep streaming on my music website. I like it. You got the <laughs> SEO. JJ mm -hmm. Crown across the board. I respect That's it. it. My brand, as it were. Right? Yes, your brand. <laughs> it's doing okay these days. It's doing all right. I got a lot of grief when I um, when I was a lawyer and uh, I used you know the stage name and call myself JJ and uh, I got a lot of grief. So I'm like, oh, what do you mean? What's this JJ stuff? I said, you know what? I'm keeping my two lives separate. That's you know? right. I'm not, you know, so it's kind of funny. So it's sort of like the old joke, the last laugh. Uh, you know, I have the last laugh on that one. That's you right. Know, That's okay, right. I'm on network TV shows and, uh, okay, <laughs> you know, I'm doing yeah. all that <laughs> movies and commercials. So the JJ works for me. It kind of fits, though, because you're like, hi, I'm JJ. They're like, yes, but what's your legal name? Yeah, right. right. No, <laughs> That's it. No legal name from the legal life. Right. There you That's go. right. It That's works. right. Right, right. Oh, man. Well, dude, this was awesome. Thanks for hanging out. This is super Thank you, cool. Brian. It was really a pleasure talking to you. A lot of fun. Absolutely. And, uh... Oh, my God! Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it is at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows... You can now do that at patreon.com slash JediBrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, and JC. Your support means so, so much, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.